Good evening, and very, I was going to say a warm welcome to the British Library. I had a nice, cool, and relaxed uh, welcome to the British Library. Uh, welcome to all of those who are here in the room and to those watching online wherever you are around the world. Who would have predicted that? I guess one person might have. <laughs> You know what? I brought the wrong script up here. I've got some completely the wrong thing, so I'm going to completely improvise. So, my name is John Fawcett. I look after the uh, events programme at the British Library, and I'm very lucky to do so. Tonight, obviously, we are celebrating not only the incredible mind and person and career and creativity of Douglas Adams, but also a fantastic new book which has just appeared, 42, The Wildly Improbable Ideas of Douglas Adams, which is, as still as we speak, a Sunday Times bestseller, the first one for Unbound. Mm -hmm. um, Richly deserved. I mean, it's been put together with loving care by the, the one and only Kevin John Davies, who many of you will know is, is the worldwide expert on anything to do with Douglas and Hitchhiker's Galaxy. And he knows even more now, having gone through that massive archive and picked out the choicest chunks to put in that book. So uh, please do buy a copy of that book afterwards if you're here. And if you're online, you can go to a little tab at the top of the screen that says books, and you can have the book sent to you. Um, who would have predicted that? Um, <laughs> so, um, what we have tonight is a fantastic programme. This is not the first time we've celebrated Douglas and Hitchhikers. Uh, just on the cusp of COVID, just when we were trying to get, oh my God, COVID is real. Uh, we had a wonderful event in here uh, on the 42nd anniversary of Hitchhikers with an all-star reading and, and many wonderful panels. But tonight will be just as good, even, if not even better than that one. So in a little while, you'll be hearing from such luminaries as Kevin, of course. Uh, you'll be hearing from Sue Lim, who was at Cambridge with Douglas. You'll be hearing from Sophie Aston who was uh, Douglas's pay, and Robbie Stamp, who was his business partner. partner. Um, so that's all to come. There will be a chance to put your questions and reminiscences uh, to, the, to the room and to the panel uh, later on. If you're here in the room, you can do that in the normal way. Uh, if you're online, you can put your question in a tab underneath the video window, and we will then read out the question that you have sent from wherever you were in the world. So, before we uh, introduce to the stage our fantastic host for this evening, the, uh, the long-term friend, uh, former creative partner of Douglas, and now obviously esteemed broadcaster, Clive Anderson, we have a short little bit of video all about the book, narrated by Stephen Fry. Forty-two, the wildly improbable ideas of Douglas Adams. After his death in 2001, Douglas Adams's papers were donated to his old Cambridge College. Over 60 boxes full of notebooks, letters, scripts, jokes, speeches, to-do lists, and even poems. But more than anything, they contain his ideas. Not just ideas for writing, but ideas about the future of the world. Wildly improbable ideas about how wonderful it would be if we could talk to our cars or if computers could store all recorded music. They also contain many notes he wrote to himself that explain what he loved, what he found difficult and everything in between. 42. The Wildly Improbable Ideas of Douglas Adams. Thank you, and please welcome to the stage, uh, Clive Anderson. Right. Thank, thank you, everybody. I've, I've already got my book, so I'm, I'm well away. Um, and I've, I've prepared lots of things to introduce the evening with, but uh, John's covered that, and then so has Stephen. So, uh, but I did, it is a particularly appropriate location to be uh, launching 42, the wildly improbable ideas of Douglas Adams, and to celebrate uh, Douglas, uh, this building, the uh, British Library, it's full of learning, works of literature, ideas, great and small, drawing on the past, looking to the future, fascinated by both the arts and the sciences and everything. Um, the building, though now recognised as a master masterpiece, took three decades to complete, and depending how you calculate, it was either five or 25 years late in opening. The whooshing sound of deadlines to gladden Douglas's heart. 
So we're here in the, uh, the Piggott uh, Theatre. I don't know which Piggott it's named after. It could be Robert Piggott, the, the, uh, uh, the philanthropist, or Lester Piggott, uh, the, uh, the jockey. I, I don't know. But we assemble in the green room, which is named after Chaucer. Uh, and, of course, his greatest works, uh, greatest work, the Canterbury Tales, he never finished uh, because he set out how many tales are going to be told, and he never, never got around to doing it. So, again, I think Douglas would have uh, appreciated uh, all of that. Um, it, was, it was kind of you, John, to suggest that I was a, a collaborator with him. I don't think I collaborated uh, that much. I certainly was a friend and indeed a neighbour in, uh, in London, in Islington. I didn't follow him to California, but uh, he only had to say. Uh, but uh, there, are, there are other collaborators here. Um, uh, we have uh, Martin Smith and Will Adams when uh, Douglas was at Cambridge, I, indeed was I. Uh, they were a formidable writing team with a very snappy, smash, snappy name, Adam Smith Adams, and they wrote all the best material uh, um, uh, maybe Douglas chipped in, maybe it was all Martin, maybe it was uh, Will, I've, I've no idea. Um, le left to his own devices when he wrote a sketch, it always went on very, very long. Uh, <laughs> he never got, got, grasped the idea that a sketch might end after two minutes. He was always basically writing uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. We also have Sandra Dickinson, who's just arrived, who was uh, Trillian and Trisha in the, the various uh, radio series. I've met her on several times, and I'd love to see you again. Uh, is, da is David Dixon here? Here as well, who sadly, sadly not. Okay. All oh, right. I'm sorry. I meant. I'm sorry. I mentioned him now, but uh, there it is. <laughs> uh, I know uh, Margot Buchanan uh, is. Is Wixie here as well, Margot? No. Oh, sadly not again. Oh dear. Uh, oh. You don't look anything like him, so that's... Uh, anyway, they, uh, that's from the world of music, which he explored as well. Um, my contribution, my um, modest contribution, was I did, in fact, is to do with the deadlines. I did uh, help him with the idea of missing uh, deadlines. He had a brief period of time as a producer at uh, BBC Light Entertainment Radio, and somebody, might have been even him, came up with the idea. There were lots of people connected with the Cambridge Footlights who were regularly employed in the BBC and about, and why not do a pantomime which just featured everybody who'd been in the Cambridge Footlights? Now, nowadays, they wouldn't want to draw attention to this. <laughs> Quite the opposite. Uh, uh, I'll just remind that line in, uh, there's, a, there's a line in Coconuts uh, where Margaret Dumont, Dumont says to Groucho, uh, I don't think you'd love me if I were poor. And he said, I might, but I'd keep my mouth shut. Uh, so, but, but in those days, for some reason, we were allowed to celebrate this and uh, Douglas commissioned me and... Uh, uh, oh, there's a, that's Cinderella. That's, that was a, um, a pantomime at Cambridge. But we went on to... Uh, he commissioned me and uh, Rory McGrath to write this pantomime. Oh, there's... <laughs> that is... <laughs> now, now, admittedly, that is roughly what I look like, but it is a posed photograph for a show. But uh, what a magnificent head of hair. Can I just... <laughs> this is a wonderful, nostalgic moment for me and my comb uh, to... Uh, those indeed were the days. Uh, anyway, there it is. Uh, so we wrote a pantomime for the radio. It was called Black Cinderella 2 Goes East or Confessions of a Glass Slipper Try On. Now, luckily, there's, no, uh, there's a hint of this in this book, but there's no script because it can't have been good, can it? Uh, but we were coupled together. I knew and liked uh, Rory. We liked each other. Uh, but the idea is we would write it together. And as you know, with uh, comedy writing, there's often somebody who, who you know, wanders around tossing off the jokes and everything, and somebody else who sits and types and gets it done. That's the classic combination of comedy writers. I'm not sure who was supposed to do what, but it turned out that Rory and I were both tossers, and we didn't get the <laughs> script written uh, very, very quickly. Uh, um, Douglas came to Cambridge, found us in a pub, and uh, took away the first half of the script, and the second half uh, seems unbelievable. You've told young people this, they wouldn't believe you, because we had to get physically get the second half to Douglas from Cambridge, and we went to Cambridge Station and found somebody who said they were going to Liverpool Street, gave her the script, <laughs> and, and she, I, she, we asked her to look out for a very tall man who'd be looking very worried, and then we phoned Douglas, say, you've got to go to Liverpool Street, there's an attractive woman, well, you, you'll, you'll nod in the crowd, and she'll be holding the script, and that's how we got the second half of the script to him. <laughs> Uh, which is at least, you know, a week too late, really, for him to... to really... Anyway, the, it, was, it, was a, it was an interesting experience. I discover from this book why John Cleese was in it, but he wasn't in the recording. He was recorded separately. I thought he was just too busy. Uh, apparently, it's because he was in dispute with the BBC and didn't want to go onto BBC premises and disliked the way things were going in the world of comedy at the BBC. It was a different world. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, I, I don't have. I don't want to ramble on too long because my main function is to introduce other people. But uh, w Douglas and I were once upon a time going to do a feature in um, in a magazine. One of those when we first met. You know, I'd remember our first meeting. So would he. But he uh, and he was slightly insulting. He said no, he couldn't do it because he couldn't remember the first time. <laughs> <laughs> he met me, uh, which I, I doesn't make any sense. He must be able to remember the first time he can remember. But anyway, I wasn't going to dispute things like that with him. Um, I remember the first because I was doing this sort of the, uh, bits and pieces of smokers and informal things we did at Cambridge, and I was doing a script of my own, performing it, and Douglas was in charge of the curtain, or the, the lights being blacked out, and he brought in the curtain too soon. He, he wasn't allowing time for my punchline to be delivered. And then he opened it up again, and uh, we had a little, quite a lot of banter about that, which was, actually went quite well, which proved two things, which proved that I'm much more comfortable improvising and bantering than I am at actually writing anything that's of any worth. And, uh, and he was right that the punchline wasn't worth waiting for. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, there it is. As we all know, he was uh, very much ahead of his time as far as technology was concerned. He was very much an early adopter of the early adopting Apple and everything else. I'm uh, different. I'm a, there's a category for me, apparently. I'm a, ma I'm a mature acceptor, uh, <laughs> which, which may sound like something you'd put on a, a dating app, but it, it's... Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I get round to doing things eventually. So I had uh, one of those... Uh, is, it, is anyone old enough here to remember those little Amstrad things? Uh, I don't usually remember how much things cost, but they were 300 quid. You had a little computer and there was a, little, a funny sort of wire attached to a little printer. And I thought it was fantastic. I really enjoyed that. But I, after a year or two, I realised I had to upgrade. So who do I ask about? I went to Douglas and said, Douglas, what should I do? And he advised, oh, you need this from Apple and something else you plug in there. There are about five different things you needed to have in those days. And uh, so how much is it going to cost? He said, well, that's a, he, so I've got, I paid 300 pounds at the Amsterdam. Oh, no, this will be more like 10,000 pounds. Uh, <laughs> I said, oh, that's a lot. Uh, well, what about the printing quality? Because the Amstrad's not very good. Oh, you, you've got to buy a printer separately. There's no... <laughs> so there's another few thousand to go on that. Um, I'll, I'll just do one more. So eventually, I was on telly interviewing people, and he'd suggest I go onto television. He, I didn't know he even noticed me, really, because he was so tall and slightly deaf. But once upon a time, he said, oh, Clive, why did you go on television? You're funnier than... And then he named some. I won't name them now. And now you think, it sounds like a humble brag, this, but he didn't say you're funnier than Billy Connolly or Dame Edna. He named a rather faded and useless star <laughs> <laughs> who had nonetheless managed to eke out a career in broadcasting. Anyway, I did get to interview him. On, uh, on my chat show, and he'd, he'd done Last Chance to See with uh, Mark Carwinine, and I thought it was a fantastic project. I was very envious. I haven't looked at the interview because it's always disappointing when I do that. Uh, but I remember it was a very happy interview, and it was the last chance to see all these various uh, disappearing species, but it wasn't quite uh, soon after that. But, it, but nonetheless, I think we're all uh, struck by the fact, and it's worth bearing in mind going forward with everybody else, it, we, there was a last chance to see Douglas, uh, and uh, we had it, and we didn't realise we were having it, and then he was suddenly uh, removed uh, from our, uh, well, from the earth, and uh, we, uh, uh, he, he made it at just the age of 49. At least it wasn't uh, the, uh, the would have been an ironical, but worse, uh, 42. So at least he got beyond that. So anyway, with this uh, looking for um, endangered species, he took a, a real interest in, and uh, he was patron of the uh, Save the Rhino International. And I uh, had the great honour of taking over from him. There he is, uh, being a rhino, or pretending. He had a great affinity with rhino. He always claimed because he had a large nose uh, that made him uh, like a rhino. I think there's more to being a rhino uh, than that. But, uh, <laughs> but anyway, I've had the honour of taking over from him as being a patron of Save, Save the Rhino. But I've never done all that running around in a rhino suit. If it's built to fit Douglas, it doesn't fit me. Anyway, let's, let's crack on. We've, uh, we saw before uh, who, who you're going to expect. And go. In due I'm going to, in the moment, bring up uh, Kevin to talk about the book. After that, we will have a number of interesting people. We've got Sue Lim, who knew um, Doug's at Cambridge. And after that, she's an author herself, has written 30-something um, books for adults, young adults and children, and a variety of comedies and 
uh, others for radio and television. She had a, a column in uh, uh, the Guardian's weekend section for a long time, Bad Housekeeping, about a, a feminist novelist in a, in a rural location. She'll have a lot to say about uh, uh, Douglas all the way through his life. I'm very much, I mean, I certainly remember meeting her, a very impressive person she was and is. Uh, then we have Sophie uh, Astin, who is uh, also a writer, but was PA to uh, Douglas for over five years. Uh, right up to his uh, his unexpected death, um, I think some mentions be, might be made of this. He was not interested in sport at all, um, but um, he, he was killed by taking up uh, a little bit of exercise. It just uh, that's a warning to all of us, I think. And uh, and also Robbie Stamp, who's a television documentary producer, and in 1995 he joined up with Douglas uh, to become CEO of their joint multimedia production company, the Digital Village. Um, and they created h2g2.com. And he's done, he's done a variety of other connections with Douglas, we'll explain in due course. But we're going to start with the uh, TV and video director, the uh, major authority, as has already been said, on the Hitchhiker's Guide, and editor of this uh, magnificent uh, uh, book, uh, 42, The Wildly Improbable Ideas of Douglas Adams. So if he can join me up on the stage, uh, we will crack on with saying more about this book. Kevin John Davies. Good to see you. So you go and sit down, I'll come and join you. Right. So I don't know how many people in the room have already seen this book or just uh, have ordered it in the way that uh, you've been encouraged to do already. But it is a, it's a magnificently produced work in terms of its, you know, it's the look of it and the feel of it. But before we get to the, the layout is the content. Now, these boxes of bits of... Uh, information, scripts, ideas, diaries, this is and that's. Were they lying around in these boxes with no, no, cu no there'd be no curating going on, or, or what? Oh, no, there had been a fair bit of curating. Yeah, um, yeah I'm uh, Adam Crothers at the, uh, uh, the archive um, at St John's Library. Yes. Which is an ama amazing place, a beautiful old building, um, four or five hundred years old, and... Uh, Amongst all the books in there, including things like um, medieval, you know, great dusty tomes on the yes. shelves and everything, in this beautiful gallery where there's going to be an exhibition next week, Friday and Saturday, um, uh, 15th and 16th, if anyone can make it up to Cambridge. Some of Douglas's Let's do papers. this event before you start plugging yeah, another well, one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So they sent me up there. Um, yeah. I, I was sent by Dirt Mags in 2016 to have a look to see if I could find any hitchhiker bits to put into the final radio show. Right, because Dirk became the he producer. Was, yeah, he was yeah. actually Douglas's choice to continue yes. after um, Jeffrey Perkins had been the producer for most of the run. Yes. Um, and, uh, yeah, he said, just find some Douglas bits that we haven't seen yet and we'll pepper it around in the script that was largely based on a book by Owen Colfer. Right. So I did that, and at the time I thought, you know, there's a book in this, but I didn't think it would be me <laughs> that would do it. Um, and then, very kindly, um, it was suggested by the family and by the uh, agent for the estate um, uh, of Douglas. Um, they suggested me, and Unbound came to me. Um, Matthew, who's here today, and uh, Rena PR um, down there, they've really appointed the rest of the team that have helped put the book together. Yes. But it was my job to go there and wade through all the material and try and make sense of it. Um, yeah. You know, there is an online catalogue that you can look at, but really that's kind of bullet points. The only way to do it is yeah. slog through every page. Yeah. And some of them are a little bit muddled up. I mean, it's amazing they're in such good nick. I think, um, you know, all these various PAs over the years, of which Sophie was the, uh, the final one, I think they probably kept everything in order, I suspect. Douglas struck me as quite a chaotic person. Well, yeah, uh, that, uh, that struck me as well, that he, he wasn't that organised. Yeah. Yet, he, he must have kept... Unless you've well, gone and dug it out of other places, <laughs> he must have kept everything... Everything uh, ever. I mean, I think maybe his mum kept a few of the very early things. There were things like um, certificates. You know, yeah. she had him checked out because he, she was worried that he was developmentally sort of subnormal. He couldn't <laughs> speak for the first few years of his life and he started yeah. talking his own language and things. Yes. But, you know, he got, he got the hang of it quite quickly after that. And uh, was, was she worried that his growth was being stunted as well? Well, not that. I mean, that no, was never no, a problem. No, he was, was always it? enormous. Wasn't and it, yeah. Because he was famous for having to wear short trousers 
well beyond when everybody else had swapped along because they couldn't get them in yeah. his size. Well, again, he was, <laughs> he was ahead of his time because everybody <laughs> wears shorts now. Um, so, so, but anyway, from school days and, uh, I mean, I uh, met him at uh, Cambridge and uh, so there's, you know, little, little smoking concerts, smokers that we used to do and yeah. they'd be sort of typed out and reproduced on some... On old Ronios and things. These are things I remember thrown them away from, afterwards. From, uh, at school in the 70s, we yes. used all these old du yeah. duplicating Duplicate, sort of processes. Yeah, right. and, but he uh, must have kept all of them. He kept everything. Yeah. And, um, you know, it was. Uh, uh, Will Adams has got a whole collection as well of, of stuff that they wrote together, and he's been the archivist for them, for Adams with Adams. And um, we just had a little comparing notes, really, because there were some written in Douglas's handwriting and some written in Will's. Yes. And um, yeah, I had to wade through it and make sense of what was there and trying. And now this one's an interesting one. On the screen at the moment is a note written by you on the back of one of the program booklets. Heavily stained. You can see the back of it was flipped upside down. Well, he was obviously very careful to keep a note from me, realising it would <laughs> well, have, I think it's have a, a lot of value to it. <laughs> it's a note to... I think it's to John Cantor. Oh, right, yes, John. It says John who, on the top. Uh, yeah, we got a yes. little message from, it, from yeah. him later. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, no, it's amazing what's in there. And I love it when it's got texture, you know, rips at the edges and coffee stains and... Goodness knows yeah. what. And his typing was just as bad as his handwriting. It's all full of tipex blobs and lots of crossings out and XXX all over the place whenever he wants to delete something. So, again, finding the story, you know. Yes. I mean, I make documentaries, archive documentaries, and I'm used to dealing with a big archive. So it's looking at the stuff and working out, well, what's the story here? We, we've kind of gone vaguely chronological. Yes. If you want to work your way through the book, otherwise leave it in the loo and just pick up the odd page every now and again. Well, <laughs> well, I, well I've picked it up and, and gone through it. First of all, I obviously went to see if there was an index to see if I could follow uh, whether I'm <laughs> there or not. But no, I had, no, to, sorry about I had that. to go through it uh, laboriously. <laughs> As I say, I was pleased that we only had... Um, we, we did have a debate about an index, but we thought... We really forego it because it's like we want more material in there. Yes. I, I'm a completist. I would have crammed more in if I could. And yeah. I had a very good copy editor that was assigned to look after me. Especially I got a bit ill last year, rather ill, and uh, I ended up in hospital briefly. And she took a lot of the weight off me. And she'd laid out many, many books. I hadn't done any books before. And yeah. so she guided me through the process. And the designer, um, Martin, who I was hoping to meet tonight, um, uh, who's not here, sadly, but um, it, she sort of work with him and uh, they settled on um, turquoise as a kind of primary colour for the thing. It was from one of Douglas's folders. Um, it was a turquoise colour and he'd right. written the logo on the front of the book is actually Douglas's own magic marker of his own name. Yes. So they've used that and that's kind of the theme throughout. So, uh, But that's right because I, I like turquoise. So we're on, in business. In fact, there's a character in there called Turquoise, as you'll see. There's a story written by Douglas, yes. and I think it's School Days, if I remember correctly, um, and it weirdly sort of presages some of his later life story. Yeah. He's talking about um, you know, a writer, a playboy, someone who maybe squanders his talent a little bit and dies too young. And that was written when he was at school. Right. And I found that quite moving when I read that. I thought, ooh, that's kind of spooky. Yes. But anyway... People so so when, did you when did you first start getting involved with the, the, the Douglas Ad Adams world, the well, I, world? I was asked to go and interview him for a fan magazine. He'd just taken a day job. It was long before he was rich and famous and he needed the money. He'd been through very difficult years. John Lloyd, his flatmate, was doing quite well in BBC Radio. Yes. But Douglas was suffering and um, he nearly went and took a job at P&O working as a shipping clerk. Somebody suggested that might be an MR5 cover, but I'd love <laughs> to know, but I don't think we'll ever know. But, um, and, but then he suddenly landed the big contract for, for Hitchhiker yes. and Doctor Who at the same time. But he took a job for a year, script editing Doctor Who. Now, as you said about him as a producer, he was chaotic. He wasn't that good a producer as far as everyone I've spoken to that remembers it. Well, I, I, I'm accepting full responsibility for the chaos that we had. It was a, Rory and my fault. Rory spoke one. about it on the radio the other day. Yes. I shared an interview with him about the book and he was talking about exactly that story. You yeah. ended up in The Baron of Beef. Uh, it might have been. It yes. was, yeah, yes. Yeah. <laughs> but that Which was only for the first half of the story. Well, that was the, pu that was the yeah. pub across the road yeah. from St John's. And I used to go there at lunchtimes whenever I went up to Cambridge. I, would, I did 17 days there last year. And I think for every day I spent in the archive, I then spent at least a week, maybe more, 
putting it all into order because I, I was just snapped away with my iPhone at all this stuff, tried to make sense. Well, you mentioned uh, John Lloyd and Douglas, and I always think that it was almost like a sibling rivalry where they egged each other there on. There was so, a bit. So John Lloyd, in, in his fantastic career, has produced all four or five of the gr of great programmes. He has. Slightly different categories, QI, yeah. uh, Blackadder, um, Not the Nine O'Clock News. Um, a he was of very well. upset, wasn't he, when D Douglas kind of fired him off writing the novel of Hitchhiker because he'd, yes. he'd helped him write a couple of episodes of the radio series of Hitchhiker. And then Douglas said, no, no, I want to go it alone. And they squabbled yeah. about it. But they made up friends very quickly. And John now says very graciously it was the right thing for Douglas to have done. Well, I think but John's success, as I think you were coming to, or at least I'm coming to, mm. is it spurred on Douglas to make sure he wrote the best radio series ever <laughs> that could then turn into a series series of uh, very unusual novels and it could be... Yeah, and, I, and then I... So I met Douglas when I interviewed him for a fan magazine. Yes. And then I worked on the TV version of Hitchhiker, which is where I met him properly, sort of professionally. But I was right. still only very young. I was a teenager still. And yes. He was very kind to me, um, very... I think because I was part of the animation team and one thing he loved about the TV show, apart from the beautiful cast... Oh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, he got on very well with the cast. Um, was that he liked the animation. So I think that yes. rubbed off on me, and I put that down to my boss, who was the animation director, Rod well, it, Lord. Well, it was Oh, quite, God, yeah, that, that, was, yeah. that was directing the making of Hitchhiker, a retrospective um, in 92, uh, with Simon Jones, who is rooted to the spot, because we're about to do a morph effect, and um, it was all new from Terminator 2. We'd managed to get the software, and the guy who worked on that, and um, he morphed David Dixon from a Vogon into, yes. into, into David Dixon as full prefect. But Simon had to keep very still for about five minutes. So that's why he's looking staring. He looks like he's about to murder me, I think. That's <laughs> what I'm putting he's him tempted, He's certainly tempted, isn't he? He does, uh, he is, uh, yeah. Because yeah. these are the, the difficulties. Something which was a, a, a throwaway line in a radio script could easily turn into, a, on the page, for a novel or the... You know, More like Zay Zayford's other head. Exactly, they're having an extra <laughs> head. But once you put it on television, it's suddenly You've got it's to a do lot of work real. to come up with something which isn't quite as imaginative as the first Yeah, idea. and Douglas was very keen always to say that he felt that the pictures were better on radio. Yes. You know, that was, that was his medium. He loved, he loved it and he wanted to do more. I mean, he was talking about um, audio adventures yeah. on CD-ROM. He actually wanted to find the technology so that you could talk to the computer and interact yeah. with, you know, he did the, the, the text computer game um, and he did that lovely, beautiful um, Starship Titanic later on. But he really, he was thinking ahead to other things. And when I, I interviewed him for Sci-Fi Channel, interviewed him many times across the 20 years I knew him, but for Sci-Fi Channel in 95, he said then, I want to get this country wired up. Mm. There should be a fiber optic to every home. Yes. And, um, you know... It well, was, I know he was good at predicting the future, but there, there isn't fibre optics. No, there isn't. Home. We're still waiting. So, yeah. <laughs> We're going to be waiting It's just completely off-beam there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but you say he wanted to do more radio. Mm. I mean, he, uh, he obviously enjoyed radio, but he also was quite pleased to get on television. And of course, he wanted to get it done in he Hollywood as well. He wanted to do the movie, and it's yes. a shame the movie came along after he'd gone. And uh, people specula speculate about how much input did he have on the movie? Was the final script based on his script and all that? I mean, that's something we could ask Robbie about a, a, a bit, but, um, you know, it, it's just a pity. But he did try with Ivan Reitman in the early 80s. He was trying to get something, and they went off and made Ghostbusters instead. As yes. he said, yeah. it was a beneficial argument for somebody. Well, I, I often go away at uh, New Year time uh, to Scotland with a bunch of people, and sometimes Douglas would come along to that. But one year he didn't come. Uh, because he was, there was a, a version of the script for the for the movie which was due in, and uh, surprise, surprise, he was a bit late with it. <laughs> so he wanted to get it done. So he stayed in London on his own in his house in London to finish off a script to, so he could deliver it on January the first or January the second. And no amount of trying to say to him, "Look, Douglas, nobody is going to be there on January the second, <laughs> waiting for you of all people to come up with the script. If you've kept them waiting for three months, you can get it another week." But he felt by staying there and getting it done, which I don't suppose he even did, he would <laughs> finally get the, uh, the film made, but it, uh, it didn't. Anyway, look, look, your, um, your book, is, it's obviously a labour of love, yeah. uh, but now, as we've, uh, you know, 
mentioned already, it's the top of the Sunday Times bestseller list. Well, that's astonishing, yeah. isn't it? I mean, so do you attribute that to his genius oh, or yours? Oh, well. <laughs> 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 I, I'm just astounded that, and I'm delighted for his family, for his friends, for the fans, that Douglas's name still means so much. Right. It can command that kind of attention. All right. Well, I... Let's let's leave you sure. to stay here. This is, uh, this is a, doing a proper chat show because I'm going to bring up uh, the other guests uh, who are going to uh, join us now. You're going to stay here. I'm going to fight uh, with that in a minute. Yeah. So I've mentioned. I wonder if I could. Oh, <laughs> is the technology <laughs> beyond you? I'm, 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 <laughs> Douglas invented that. <laughs> now, the, um, I'm going to invite, I've mentioned, we've mentioned already who are the guests. So, so could we now be joined by Sue Lim, Sophie Aston, and Robbie Stamp? Can I move along or stay here? No, you stay, you stay there. That's, uh, that's fine. I'm going to fight with this now. Yeah. Go on. How do you open it? I, I'm going to show my skill. Got go on then. Yeah, my skill. All you have to do is to push that up like oh, that. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> Piece of cake. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, Would you want some? Oh, thanks. So you're all, you're all settled in now. So, Sue, if I can start with you. Sure. I remember I first got to Cambridge. You, were, um, you and Douglas and John Lloyd come to that. You were all already there, very impressive, very clever people. I was worried about being found out, uh, generally. Um, uh, but um, so you knew Douglas from 1970-something on. 70-something, yes. Um, I first met him... Um, at an audition, I was directing um, production, very sort of teenagerish, sort of no theatre production, of The Good Person of Sichuan. Oh, right. And he turned up to audition. Well, there, uh, there's your letter offering him the part. Oh, so goodness me. What part did I offer? I like to be the man <laughs> in the family of, of eight. There was a family. Yeah. And the minute he walked in, I was sort of gobsmacked because here was arriving this beautiful giant with a smile such as... I just wanted to say something about his smile, yeah. actually. His, his smile contained this feeling that what we were doing was preposterous. Yeah. <laughs> and it wasn't just auditioning for the good person of Sichuan that was preposterous, although it was. It was the whole... Homo sapiens enterprise. <laughs> in a, life and everything. Life yeah. and everything, yes. And um, in, it's about a year or two later, I, I directed a production of The Rivals in which he played Sir Lucius O'Trigger, a sort yeah. of uh, sw swaggering mad Irishman. And um, Douglas's smile yes. just unfortunately undid us all because of all the... I mean, I'm talking now about Douglas as an actor, which... Probably most people here haven't had any experience of. Well, I scarcely had an experience of it. Yeah. I don't remember him doing a lot of it. Well, there were shows that that uh, Will and Martin did with him, and like like all of us who do sort of sketches and things, we, we're sort of acting. Um, uh, but well, he's almost too big to be an actor. Well, almost too big to be an actor, yeah. and um, but he had this problem, which was that his smile was just sort of impossible to resist, and he, he was a terrible corpser. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely terrible. And, and we were, I, I was also performing in rather a greedy way um, in this production of The Rivals. I was Lyd Lydia Languish. I was yeah. on the stage. Uh, Douglas was on the stage. Is this I looked up the stage. Oh, God. Well, that's no, that, Douglas. No, that's, <laughs> that's my maid. Yes. <laughs> and um, he was corpsing. Yes. And I had made the terrible mistake of looking him in the eye. Yeah. And it did for me. I just completely went. And I had to sort of stay looking at it. And everybody who came on stage caught it. And we were all sort of... Ter I mean, it's de deplorable, really. Yes. But, <laughs> but he, was, he was dynamite of the wrong sort when it came to that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's, that was maybe your first year or two at, at Cambridge. And uh, did you keep in touch with him after that? Yes, actually. Um, in a funny kind of way, he kept coming up to do direct things, and mm. I, I was a bit older than Douglas, and um, so I was already kind of doing research stuff. Uh, and riding around on my bike, curiously, quite often, I would see this sort of huge loping figure on a yeah. pavement, and I uh, you know, might not have seen him for several months. Yes. And I, um, I stopped, of course, and I said, oh, Douglas, how are you? And one time he said, gloomily, I've just auditioned for Footlights and they won't have me. 
<laughs> now, I want to find out who that person was. It wasn't you, was it? No, it wasn't me. I was never in a position of authority over him. <laughs> well, and I might have been the person who got the job. <laughs> <laughs> Whoever it was. Whoever it was, didn't deserve yes, it. Yes, they're, they're the people who, they're, yeah. they're the same category as the people who would not, um, are the publishers who would not recognize that Harry Potter was, you know, more than just a sort of trivial little uh, book for, for yes. kids. Um, a bit like um, my brother was at uh, school with Brian Jones of the Rolling Stones. Of course, in those days, they were just s sort of spotty six-formers. Yeah. And um, well, Brian... Well, you, not a spotty six -formers. Oh, that's right. That's a lovely case. Yeah. Anyway, um, my, and Brian Jones said to my brother, who had a band, a, mm. a little skiffle group in the sixth form, please, Roger, can I be in your band? And Roger said, no, Brian, I'm sorry. I don't think you quite, quite got what it takes. <laughs> <laughs> Well, there you are, yeah. Uh, well, if, if he'd survived, he could have been just releasing a new record uh, this week, couldn't he? But uh, he didn't. Talking about people who've uh, rejected things, uh, an old friend of mine, an old friend of Lugger's, John Cantor, has sent a message, a great uh, writer and an amusing cove, and uh, he rejected my best thing I'd ever written, uh, first of all, but, uh, but never mind, I still got it on. Uh, anyway, he, I'd, I'd like to deliver it like John Cantor, who always has a lugubrious look to him, but it's very, very funny. Uh, but he says, my name's John Cantor, and I was Douglas's flatmate in Holloway when he wrote the first Hitchhiker book. He was a kind and loyal friend, but I cannot recommend him too lowly as a flatmate. <laughs> because he did most of his thinking in the bath, and there was only one. <laughs> hours and hours he spent in that bath, so many hours that when he emerged, his thinking was wrinkled. <laughs> When he wasn't in the bath, he was in the attic, typing, smoking Marlborough and listening to Kate Bush's Wuthering Heights over and over again. Uh, I remember that flat. It was much worse than this. Even, uh, presumably because her voice seemed to come from far out in the uncharted backwaters of the unfashionable end of the western spiral arm of the galaxy. Most, what I admired most about Douglas, apart from the scale of his talent and ambition and his colossal male member, uh, was... <laughs> <laughs> Keep it classy, John. Uh, was, his, uh, was his indifference to sport. He wasted no time thinking about it, let alone watching it or playing it. But he definitely heard of Tim Henman, because at some point in the late 90s, he asked me to explain Tim Henman to him. How come, if Henman was so good, he'd never won Wimbledon? <laughs> I explained it like this. Henman could beat anyone in the world, but he couldn't do that seven times running, which is what you had to do to win Wimbledon. Without a pause, Douglas replied, I've got half that problem. I can't beat anyone in the world, but I can do that seven times running. <laughs> so, uh, yes, very good. He did get a slightly interested in sport. He got, uh, when, um, was it Talia 90? It was Nesson Dorma. He, he, he was played that at large volume, but, but he was, in general, not a sporty person, was he? No. And, no. Until he took up whatever that exercise was he mm. took up in California, which... Mm. Uh, oh, at one point, um, James Cameron was looking at hitchhikers and had uh, got an option or something, and Douglas was all Jim this and Jim that in about 92. Yes. And, um, and he said he took him white, white water rafting. <gasps> I yes. can't imagine Douglas <laughs> in My the middle God. of... Something like James Cameron, yeah, he lives in the yes. water, I think, most of the time. But um, Well, yeah, he's, yeah. Uh, he's had some experience I'm just trying to picture that, yeah. you know. <laughs> well, he wouldn't want... I mean, he would be a bit of a liability, wouldn't he? Because if he got into difficulty in the water, who's going to carry him out of the water? <laughs> All right, so that's, uh, that's a, a, a nice message from, from John. Um, um, uh, Sophie, if I can uh, come to you. Uh, so you've, you've been mentioned in dispatches already. You are his PA... Now, there's a lot of material that's had to be organised here. How was it to work as his PA? You didn't know about Hitchhikers when you first started uh, No, there. I was uh, recruited to the Digital Village in, um, I think you said, 1996, and I got a call from a recruitment agency inviting me along to an interview, and they said, there's a, a famous author who, who co-owns the company, um, and his name is uh, Douglas Adams, and it sort of rung a bell, and I thought, oh, yes, I think Watership Down, I think that's <laughs> sort of genned up on my sort of yes. rabbit, you know, history, yeah. and uh, rocked up to the interview. Anyway, um, it obviously wasn't. Um, but I think the fact that I'm not a Hitchhiker fan, the fact that I hadn't read it and been invested in the whole saga, yeah. um, probably helped a little bit. You've got to explain, you did it. become a fan, obviously, otherwise you'd be torn limb from limb by this, <laughs> this audience. I mean, yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> 
Yeah. Not, so not, not to the you're scale. Safe. Yeah, so I'm this safe. was at a time where he was, uh, you know, highly successful and in, in demand for Absolutely. this, that and the other, yeah, which yeah. So my PA role, role is quite a hard one. Yeah, so my, my role was essentially sort of corralling him on his day-to-day -day sort of life. And uh, there we go, here's a picture at Macworld. Yeah, you're corralling him there, are corralling. you? Yeah. Well, corralling. <laughs> <laughs> that was uh, July 2000, I think that was, in New York. Yeah. All right. Yeah, well, he's... So this is one of the Macworld. This was a, an Apple Masters event. So he was an Apple Master where it's a group of sort of forward-thinking uh, doers, I suppose you'd call them. Anyone yeah. from sort of music, literature, uh, sport, film... Um, I think he's um, famously that he was he the first person to get an apple in the country in or the Europe, second? I think. Yeah. Yeah, I think Stephen Fry was the second. Yes. Yeah. Well, I don't know. If well, that's, that's quite a quite a quite achievement a to get ahead of thing. Stephen on exactly. things yeah. like that. <laughs> yeah. um, so these events were held, and and uh, all these people were given basically free sort of Mac stuff to go away and play with, and and then they'd be brought together to sort of evangelise to the to the world about how wonderful Apple uh, products were. So yes. so he loved all of that. Yeah. And what about what you know working generally for him was that a uh, Do you know what? I mean, people sort of think that he must have been very chaotic, but actually I never really saw that side of him. He was very easygoing. It was not a struggle to get him, you know, from A to B and to do things and sign autographs and attend events. It was, uh, you know, pretty straightforward and fun. So he enjoyed meeting fans. and uh, Very much, yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, we're, we're in due course, we're going to have... So I hope everybody in the audience is thinking of questions to ask all and every uh, one of the guests here. Um, uh, but uh, Rob, Robbie Stamp, now explain your... Uh, you were very much part of this late period, uh, Douglas Adams, but you knew him for a long while. Yeah, the definitely late period. I mean, no claims to the sort of the, the, this era of storytelling. We met when I was a TV producer at Central TV via a mutual friend who, looking back as I got to know Douglas, was a deeply forlorn hope. He hoped that Douglas would co-write a script with him called Subculture. And uh, he invited me along to the meeting, and I met at Duncan Terrace. Yes. And I remember a wonderful first conversation about Herman Hess and the glass bead game and Bach and music and just a wonderful connection. And he said, come and have lunch. Mm. And we set up a business, but genuinely became close personal friends. I mean, as you know, right. I spoke to him the night before he died. So, you know, we were, we were we're not just business colleagues, close yes. personal friends. Yes, yeah. But just explain it, so Herman Hess led to you a big... Yeah, Herman, Herman Hess led... Well, the, I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd been at Central as a young producer um, looking at... It was an era where reading Wired magazine, the famous Wired magazine, I, 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 it was a company run by men for whom, as far as they were concerned, the computer was a typewriter. And it, yeah. was, what, you know, it was what their secretaries did. So kind of waving it under their nose, saying this is going to change everything, this is going to change everything. And I'd written a business plan, unasked for, called Cable City, about making new programs in new ways. And they rejected that. They hadn't asked for it. And it turned into a, something called the Digital Village. And some time into our relationship, now I was sitting with Douglas, we were chatting, and I told him about it, and he said, how much would it cost to invest? I'd like to be your business partner. Mm. And I made a figure up out of the air, and he said, I'm in. <laughs> uh, and that was it. And that, that was the beginning of an incredibly exciting ride uh, when, you know, right at the beginning of, you know, dial-up internet. I mean, when we launched Hitchhikers, the, 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 the website based on Hitchhikers, HGGT.com, mm. Douglas launched it live on Tomorrow's World. And it was a dial-up world. It was a <laughs> world, and it was a, it was a, it was a. Yeah, that was his card. He wanted, and he designed the logo as well. I mean, still to this day, the thing that's there in the, uh, you know, the HTTP. He designed that clever logo. So yes, chief fantasist. So yeah, and it was, yeah. it was a, it was with fabulous colleagues, incredibly dynamic young team. It was a really privileged, exciting period of my life. So and it, so you and he were looking at all this. I mean, a lot of these things have come along in you know similar ways or different ways. You know, you know the whole world of gaming and things, and and be, being able to use the uh, the resources of the internet to mm -hmm. go into into fantasies as a sort of pre pre set up, but sort of depend upon the the user as well. Why? How was he, how were you and he and everyone else to go? Uh, you know, alive to all these possibilities. Um, it's a slightly strange question, but no, it's a good question. I mean, uh, I suppose that that. That's a good question. And I'm gonna, I think that one of the things that I think runs through all of Douglas's work is a fascination with perspective. I think, I think if, you, if, if, you, if you look at 
hitchhikers would, what if there was a super intelligent shade of blue? You think about rhinos, that brilliant description in Last Chance to See where he's, he's conceptualizing rhinoceroses because of their unbelievably sensitive smell, seeing and being in some kind of 3D smellscape. Um, it's there in Dirt Gently. And I think that, so maybe an answer, Douglas was just relentlessly, joyfully curious about perspective. So when something new came up like that, that famous quote about when he's asked, you know, how big, what, what are the changes all this is going to bring, and that great river rules, you know, what you say, you know, what do you say to the Amazon and the Nile and so on when they reach the sea? All I can tell them is that river rules won't apply. And I think it's that fascination with perspective that, that, that drove him, because he was an arts graduate. Yes. So it's fascinating that that evolution from being an arts graduate and, and, and fullest to that fascination with science and science fiction. Um, and, and in a way, I think a lot of his life after the fame of Hitchhikers was filling in the gaps intellectually, things he'd taken a phenomenally creative intellectual jumps and leaps into. A lot of the people of the time that he liked to spend subsequently was about filling in these gaps, this great, in his mid-twenties, these great leaps that he'd taken. Is that something of a comment on the, as I say, British, particularly the English education system that likes to categorise people and to, you know, at A level stage or even before, you, you, you don't do sciences or you do do, uh, you do, do them. And if, you're, if he was interested in the English language and history or language or something, then you don't do that. So a lot of people then never get back in touch with science and the other way around if they're a scientist, they never get. Uh, and so he was linking back in, as you say, to that area of intellectual curiosity that he, he hadn't ex explored at school and at university because we just don't. We, no. we don't just major in a subject. We only do one subject at yes. university, which is... Some of this mind that, that you know, loved the style and the craftsmanship of a woodhouse. I mean, again, again it's you know, important to remember, as he, read, he was a huge craftsman, his love of words and the, you know, the, how hard it was to craft them, you know, the, the, he, he, the, the words and things, through to the, you know, the friendships he made later on with you know, a lot of the great scientists and Richard Dawkins. And, you know, in the early days of Amazon, uh, you know, he was a very generous man as well, and what would arrive you know, with the title, like, Why Do Elephants Have Big Ears? Yeah. Um, through the door, and, uh, and he was just, so it's, I think it was that innate fascination with perspective and what if, what if, what if, what if. Yes. And it informed his comedy and I think it informed his intellect. Mm. Um, so just go back to the Hitchhikers and the developments of that. Mm. So that was going on sort of in parallel to the work you were perhaps doing. Well, it, D Douglas's fame on Hitchhikers definitely precedes me. I mean, I, I, yeah. you know, I had nothing to do with that at all. Yeah. And I think it was, a, I think one of the challenges when you have the kind of success that Douglas had in his early 20s, is there's always a danger of people feeling they're living their life backwards, that, that you've done the big thing you're gonna do in your 20s. And what, 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 what next, what's gonna happen next? So Hitchhikers was both obviously an enormous blessing for many, many reasons. Yes. It's a financial blessing, a creative blessing, it made him world famous. But there's also rather like a, a, a black hole, there's a gravitational pull yes. in his life, which I think he spent a lot of his later life trying to escape. Yeah. He wanted to be remembered for other creative things. So you've got Dirt Gently, right. you've got Last Chance to See, which he was immensely proud of. But I think the Digital Village gave him a chance to work with some teams, you know, primus inter pare, it's very much so, but, but to, to work creatively uh, and to explore some other parts, maybe with a little less pressure. Yeah. Um, but I think it gave him a, another place intellectually to play in and explore in. Yeah. And Starship Titanic, with its... Your goodness, we're looking at ChatGTP three and four and five at the moment. Well, five isn't here yet, I know. Yeah. ChatGPT four. You know, we I, I had no clue how difficult the game that he wanted to embark on as the chief executive of this company. We were trying to create a really sophisticated chatbot. <laughs> we were going to design our own 3D engine. I mean, it's just as well I didn't know. Well, he'd be <laughs> excited to uh, the developments now. Oh, he would. I mean, he, 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 he'd be thrilled. And I do quite a lot of work and thinking about AI. Mm. And... Uh, you know, one of the things I lead with very often is, is, is paranoid AI. I mean, it's a joke, but, you know, I've asked, do you want paranoid AI? Yeah. You know, is there some of We're the, all the paranoid about that, AI. Yeah, I'm yeah. paranoid about it. Yeah. And would you want, a, you know, a robot who was having a bad day to drive your kid to school? Well, you know, <laughs> maybe not. That's, oh, yeah. it's just too much. I'm yeah. just going to, I'm just going to go. It's yeah. red. I don't care. Um, sure. you know. yeah. <laughs> but can I back, come back to you, Sophie? You're d dealing with all these various things. You had Ed Victor, his, you know, literary agent yeah. and presumably encouraging him to write 
more and more things that were, you know, he could market further. But and you were his peer right up till his uh, death, which obviously came as a shock to fans, family, friends, and everything. But to to you in uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, I I'd just been out in in Santa Barbara the day uh, Santa Barbara, and then subsequently to a, a keynote. <laughs> That's a story. <laughs> I'll tell you about in a minute. So, um, so he was <laughs> so yeah. he was out there. Working hard. No, that wasn't uh, California. That, that, was, that was Fiji. That was 2000, January, I think it was. He was on holiday. Oh, right. And he was so delighted to find a full mobile phone signal in the middle of nowhere that <laughs> yeah. he thought, I've got to phone somebody. So he rang me, and it was sort of 3 o'clock in the morning, and I answered the phone in my flat in South London. And uh, that was very typical, Douglas, just not quite sort of thinking through, but very, yeah. very excited. Um, and, and you discovered why there was It was good because Tom Hanks had filmed Castaway, the movie, uh, on this island, Monoriki. Uh, and, and having a full, you know, satellite master was one of the, 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 the uh, sort of riders that he had. So, right. so that was a, a nice. It's hell of a rider, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but uh, this is well worth noting. Anybody who lives in the country or in a remote part of, you know, anywhere, try get, and get, get a film. It doesn't be Tom Hanks, but yeah, it could well, be anyone. a film of some sort <laughs> exactly. made. Uh, hire out your house. Douglas used to, to say about the Pacific Coast Highway. Let's get Tom Hanks to do a movie there because yes. that uh, had a, yeah. a lot of dead spots there. But he felt he had to go to California to, to Hollywood to. And I know we're pointing at a, a picture of him in Fiji, but that yeah, gives yeah, you yeah. a rough <laughs> idea of some of the aspects of life he might like. Because he felt by going there, he could more likely get it made well, into I a movie. I guess so. I mean, Robbie's probably a better place to talk about about that side of it really why he you know the, the the engine of the movie sort of starting to tick for the second or third time I think even um yes I mean it, it had been a lifelong ambition hadn't it I mean your yeah. an ambition to have the movie made mattered to him hugely and I think I don't know what that script you were talking about was the famous 240 page script <laughs> that God have got delivered because I think the, the, the first script Douglas delivered Hollywood in yeah. a script of what 115, 120 pages. And Douglas had had all the guide entries and everything, yeah. and and it was it was a it was a, 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 a I think he when he when he, he did go to Hollywood to try and get it made absolutely mm -hmm. unequivocally he wanted to be close close to the action, and I think he could never quite understand how Hollywood did it. Kind of Hollywood does what Hollywood does, which is at one level you know you're at you're welcomed in as an absolute A-list star, which he was, yeah. but at another it's a town which you've not made money for. And so I think it was it was it was difficult, and I think we had some, you know, it, w w getting to the stage where you know script write, the studios didn't necessarily want him to write the script, and then that was very difficult because you know writing Douglas actually is very difficult. Douglas is phenomenally difficult to pastiche. In fact, mm -hmm. you know, it, it was he, it's sub Douglas Adams writing is really awful, and and I think it's very, it's very hard. So yeah, it was a it was a that <coughs> week, the night. Before he died, as you were talking, uh, my, my father had died that previous day on that that day, mm. and uh, he'd been very very kind and very solicitous through that whole thing when my dad was dying. And I got home from the hospital and Douglas called, and we we, we talked about you know m my dad, but then you know he sensitively realised I wanted to sort of shift the shift the the energy of the conversation, and we talked about the movie that night. Right. But we also critically talked about other projects other things he wanted to do, there were other movies he wanted to write, yeah. there were other ideas, there was a big documentary series he wanted to do on evolution, there were lots of other things bubbling in his mind creatively. Yeah. So it was, a, it was, a, it was a, a very sharp, poignant you know, call in which, in a way, the reason I, I, I reflect again on it in the book, in, in this wonderful book, uh, was, was that phone call I think encapsulated a lot of what was special about Douglas. I mean, the deep, Personal concern. He was a good friend. Yes. You know, he was a good friend. He was a kind man. He was a generous man. He had. He and Jane were incredibly great hosts. Yes. If anybody was lucky enough to go to these great music evenings at Duncan Terrace and things, he was a generous, gregarious man. Huge conversationalist. Uh, a great. And, and like, I love sport. And he didn't. And I, one of the only times I really got a bit of a dusty answer when I think it, one of the books, Kevin will know, he talks about the last test of the summer being played at Lords. And I pointed out that the last test was always played at the Oval. And that didn't go down very well. That was not a, that, that was, that was, that was, that was not a good moment. Uh, but yeah, he was, yeah. He was, he was a, personally, he was a very good friend. He was a good man. He, he certainly was. And uh, as we mentioned, his size a lot. But he was definitely uh, in that category of gentle giant. He never mm. used his size to intimidate anybody. He was a, a, a more of a glumping uh, sort of uh, overgrown puppy than, than anything like that. But uh, the, the, whether these delays of getting the film not made, of course, there was always a, a, a thing that the technology was advancing 
film technology was advancing. So it was getting closer and closer to being possible to make, I don't know if you would agree with that. Well, I, I've worked on the animation for the TV run, and he said that he was planning a movie, and I said, well, what are you going to do about the graphics? I'm thinking, yeah. not, I think I'm being edged out here. And he said, oh, I've been to see The Cray 2. Yeah. He said, cool, you should see that thing. It can't half add up. <laughs> <laughs> he said, uh, but it's very expensive, and I think I've saved enough up to buy the seat. All right. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm from the world of criminal law. Cray 2 sounds like the Cray twins to me, but that's, uh, <laughs> I, I got slightly confused there. But <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, two of them, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, so what, what are you, in his uh, well, yeah. various developments, did you, did you follow his career closely? I followed his career closely, but my, um, my, my familiarity with Douglas was all in his sort of middle period. And an uh, interesting question you threw up a few minutes ago. You said, after this global success, mm. You know, did he have problems with, and certainly he did famously have problems with the sort of sequel. In fact, uh, I heard that this is probably something you can just um, um, confirm, that his publisher, Sue Freestone, actually moved into his flat. Yeah, because there was a lot of that, yeah. Because otherwise he would never have completed the manuscript. Yeah, he, he went away to a, um, a hotel in the country at one point and ha insisted on having a computer there. But back when it was still fairly rudimentary, you know, mm. and um, they locked him in. I think. Yeah, they, they locked him in. Yeah. Were right you part in. of that locking in process? No, Were you, never. You, uh, <laughs> There's a note in the book from yeah. um, where he's left a note for Sunny Meta yeah. at Pan, saying, "Well, here's the latest bit. I've gone for a walk." But um, <laughs> he, he stood over him for something like yeah. a month in a nice posh hotel yeah. on, on Park Lane. Yes. He was allowed to use the hotel pool or go for a walk in Hyde Park, <laughs> and then he had to be straight back at the time. Yes. And he, he did might as well be in an embassy. You know. Bashing away on a typewriter yeah. for the first four books before he even touched a word processor. And I think his sister, Little Jane, yeah. used very, I think she used to go and he, he wanted to read lines out as well. He wanted yeah. to kind of get what, what were they landing, not. So I think it was a sort of performance art component. Mm. to try to get the thing done well, as well. Well, so he did days of negative writing in that he, he spent the day crossing out what he'd done the day before. I mean, and so that at the end of the week, he had, he'd written less than he had at the beginning. Yeah, that's, <laughs> right, yeah, that's what Jeffrey Perkins said. He yes. used to write backwards. Yeah. It would get uh, shorter and shorter. And, it were, on, you know, in the original radio series, they were still writing <laughs> next week's episode while They locked him in one. a cupboard, typing <laughs> away, while they were in the studio yeah. next door. Yeah. Well, well, but I, I want to bring you back in the studio, because you're a writer yourself. Mm. Do you find that you have to uh, motivate yourself to get things? Or do you need a deadline? Do you need a, mm. a PA? Do you need a publisher, an editor standing over you? Or do you just, just flows out of you? No, no, it never flows, no. Um, I, think that, I think it's very important, actually, to have somebody um, in the sidelines, preferably not actually at the dining table with you, as, yeah. as Douglas um, must have experienced. Um, no, it's, uh, I think it's very, very easy to, to just miss a day or two and then to sort of get back into it is so difficult. Yeah. Um, but I, uh, I, I never sort of... Uh, I, I never collaborated on a writing project with, with Douglas, my in interaction with him was much more personal. Yes. And um, there, was a, there was a big sort of enterprise in the, um, in the Rainbow, the Rainbow Theatre in mm -hmm. probably the early 1980s. Yeah, and Finsbury I lived near... Finsbury Park. Yeah, yes, that's right, Finsbury yeah. Park. And it was Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy on stage. Oh, yeah. And it was sort of chaos because... Was it, was it Ken... Uh, Ken Campbell. Ken Campbell, oh, yes. Ken Campbell. Another creative genius. <laughs> He's a now, he was a, such a genius. Yes. Uh, but, it, but, it, but very sort of difficult to work with. And yeah. Douglas came to see me and said, um, Sue, I, I wonder if you would mind just coming along as a sort of assistant director. Yeah. Um, don't oh, say wow. anything to Ken, Ken about yes. it. <laughs> there's sort of, I was sort of a sort of um, secret assistant director, and I just sort of yeah. because Ken would sort of. You're an assistant director to a director didn't know you were an That's assistant right. director. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That's right. Yeah. yeah. It was a little bit clandestine. Yes. Um, I mean, Ken's approach was to stand. He said, "I'm going to be standing at the front of the stage here, by the front of the stage. It will be my instinct to move further and further back towards the lobby." Um, and he, you actors have got to stop me. And of course, some actors sort of yeah. you know, swam with this and thought it was yeah. great and you know, the water was lovely, but others just wanted somebody to take them into a little anteroom and say, 
try projecting your voice a little bit more yeah. and slow down, you know, stuff like that. All right. Anyway, and that was that, uh, uh, during that period, I had my great mischance with Douglas, because you know how spontaneous he was. He came to see me one day. I was between boyfriends, he was between girlfriends. He said to me, Sue, uh, I'm going to Tuscany. Do you want to come with me? And I thought, God, I was at the time a sort of rather troubled by migraines. And I, there were two things that put me off. One was uh, the fear that I would become ill. And I had this horrible kind of Alan Bennett moment. I don't think I should go to Tuscany <laughs> with Doug. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to become nauseated in San Gimignano. Yeah. <laughs> very, a very good Alan Bennett impression, <laughs> but a very poor justification for your decision. No, there, there was another slightly... Uh, right. John Cantor alluded cruelly to this. John Cantor became my housemate after he moved out from sharing a flat with Douglas. Yes. So I'd heard rumours of Douglas's, how shall we say, sort of significant endowment. <laughs> and I really... Not... I didn't want this discussion to <laughs> focus entirely. Into, and I didn't think you would be the one to, to, to force it on us, as it no. were. <laughs> I just chickened out, I'm afraid. Yeah. <laughs> Well, of all the things I thought we'd learn uh, <laughs> about Douglas, so I thought I knew some of it, and I had some new stuff in the book, lots of new stuff in the book. But now we're going into, into greater territory. <laughs> there, there were a few. No, no wonder you've got a migraine. Now, what's the. <laughs> uh, there were a few love letters amongst yes. the boxes of things, but we only right. put one or two things in the book. We were fairly discreet, I think. Yes. But yeah, one of those kept a, referring to him as Big Douglas. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> He's a tall man. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I assume. Now I'm thinking again. Yes. Okay. Look, um, let's 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 bring this back on track. Uh, so we've got time set aside for questions from the audience, and I don't know that fills some people with horror. Oh no, I've got to do something. And other people think, yes, about time too. You and your waffling arm there. You're not you're not saying anything of the stuff we're supposed to be talking about. Now uh, I have some experience of getting questions from audiences. The, the the first person to, to have it is you are the hero. Because once we get, don't be the sort of person, I've come across this sort of people as well. You do an event like this, and after they come to, well, what I was going to ask, and they ask a brilliant question, but on a one on one basis uh, afterwards. So if you've got a brilliant question, now the time is to do it. Now, who is going to be the first person who breaks the ice? Yes, sir. Uh, now, you're going to bring, <laughs> you're going to bring you, you want a microphone. So, um, no, 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 but. Uh, so you can say your name if you like, because that'll set a precedent. Uh, uh, Peter Gordon, um, yeah. you say he was the script editor on uh, Doctor Who for a year. What do you think he was like to work with for, if, if you're right as a script editor? Right, OK. Um, who is the person to ask this? Uh, well, I met, I met him when he was working on Doctor Who, right, and, okay. and, and it was really obvious that when, when we were interviewing him, he was enjoying being interviewed because it kept him away from the real world. <laughs> and, and we as fans were loving it. And the producer kept coming into the office and going, um, Douglas, we've got that uh, scene to write yes. before the end of the day. And, so, and trying to chivvy him along. Yeah. And then Douglas would just draw him into the conversation as well. Yes. To try and extend it. So the idea of putting Douglas in charge of wrangling scripts out of everybody else <clears> was <throat> hilarious, really. But, you know, he did it for a year. Yeah. It was a year when the BBC was increasingly, the budgets were getting smaller and smaller. Um, and there was a significant amount of humour went into the scripts. Mm -hmm. But, um, I mean, I think, um, I think he got on very well with people, uh, some of the writers that he worked with. They, he obviously connected with some of them. Uh, I was a bit sad he didn't quite connect with the, another hero of mine, which was Terry Nation. And he said, he's a terribly nice man, but oh, he can't write. So it was, I was a bit crushed to hear that. But. All right. Well, I'm sure Terry Nation was as well. But, uh, that's, uh, well, well uh, Called at least nobody's going to hear it now. <laughs> no, no, no. It's, um, it's all gone. Well, my experience could just go back to my little pantomime we wrote, and all I could, my, I don't remember him being in any way uh, crushing or difficult, uh, but I do remember the various stars who were in it, and I'll just say Peter Cook was fantastic. He was marvellous. He would say, well, this line here, oh, is there any way if I said so? And he would come up with a, a correction in the politest way possible. Not everybody in the cast was quite the same as that, but uh, <laughs> there we are. That's as far as I'm going to leave it. So unless anyone else has got some thoughts about his uh, being 
being a, an editor of other people. I suppose the implication behind your question, it's all very well having... Some people are good editors, they can... Yeah. But perhaps somebody who writes in his own individual way, uh, and, a rather, and, a, and a brilliant way, is not, is, is, might just say, well, this is not good enough, rather than um, suggest a... And it was an unfortunate year in the way for Doctor Who, because at that same year, Hitchhiker took off big time, and he had lots of pressure to go and get on with other variants yeah. of Hitchhiker, including the TV version. And so I think maybe the work then on Doctor Who suffered a little bit. It was sort of a feast or famine thing, wasn't it? Because he, he was a bit out of work for, for a long while. And he thought about taking a job in Hong Kong. Yeah. Um, which I remember discussing with him. And I said, yeah, yeah, go on, go to it. I know it might get in the way of writing, but it'll give you uh, some yeah. experience. Prior to that, a Bad know. advice, obviously. Because <laughs> he might not have written Hitchhiker if he'd gone yeah. off. I mean, was Pri it maybe the Hong Kong police or something? A rather unlikely prospect of him in short <laughs> uh, <laughs> again. Um, Anyway, so yes, so don't don't. Our man in Hong Kong. Let's let's have another question, please. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Sir. I can see a hand up there. So the microphone's coming to you. Sorry if you're a close personal friend of mine. I can't quite no, see. No, no, no. Uh, we know I'm, I'm Tom. I was Tom. really struck by what Robbie said about Douglas Adams' style being very difficult to pastiche, and I was wondering if anyone on the panel had any experience of Douglas uh, having his work translated because I know that's something that some authors take a great deal of interest in. But for Douglas, was that... Was that just somebody else's problem? Uh, or was that something that he poured over with his usual fastidious care? Sophie, I know he, had, he did have say, lots of editions in yeah, the different languages. I, mean, I remember him saying that um, Hitchhiker didn't translate well into the Romantic languages, but he was really uh, big in Germany, um, so, and maybe Eastern Europe, uh, but not so much in France. Oh, right. Yeah. And was there a linguistic reason for that? I or think just so, the, yeah, possibly. Just the, um, this is, what is this nonsense? <laughs> 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 yeah. But no, I don't think he was involved sort of specifically in that sort of uh, side of things, as far as I can remember. Yeah. No, I don't think so. No. Think there was a French translation of the radio series. Um, mm. Oh, there's a, a French fan club. A friend of ours, is Nick Botti, who, who yeah, adapted Nicholas it. Botti. Yeah, yeah, he did a very good job of it. And, uh, what we really need is from the internet or whatever, which I don't know how I should describe a, a question from France now, saying how, <laughs> how magnificently he is respected over there. But I don't, but I, I don't think he's sort of like back translated or worked with a translator to say, you know, for some of the more difficult words, why are you choosing that? Back translate. I don't think he did that. I think partly because there were so many different language versions, mm. actually. Well, I don't know how many language versions there Dave are. Dave Haddock's your man. He's got uh, most yeah. of them, I think. Yeah. He collects them. Where are you, Dave? There he is. Yeah, Dave, how, how many, how many Dave, have you what, got? What would your guess be? Okay, the weirdest one I have is Macedonian. Right. <laughs> Macedonian? <laughs> now, I've, got, I've got Czech, I've got um, uh, Yiddish at home, I've got, I've got a number of different... <laughs> I've got a box of translations. I've got a Japanese one yeah. from a friend who brought it back, and I thought, that looks interesting, I wonder what it's all about. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I know he had a, he, there was a bookshelf one, or a bookcase, which is, well, he's got lots of books there, but they were all hitchhikers <laughs> in their various languages, but uh, there it is. A, a, anyone, any questions about this book, this uh, collection of things? Yes, sir. Hey, is the microphone coming to you? Hello, there. Hi. Um, yeah, one thing we learned from your book uh, is that there was planned to be a second TV series of Hitchhiker. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's a little bit of a script extract in there. How much of the script of the second series exists? Very little. I mean, there's a scattering of pages. They don't all seem to hook together. I don't know if there's some missing. Um, you know, it, or if it was just he wrote bits as they occurred to him or something. Um, but yeah, I put a little taster of it in. But has it been, had it been actually commissioned? Or, or we were expected to work on it. As an, yeah. uh, I mean, I was working then for Rod Lord at the animation company, Pierce Studios, and we were two weeks away from starting on series two yes. when it was cancelled. Right. And um, it was because he didn't want to work with Alan Bell again. He, was, he really wanted Jeffrey Perkins, who hadn't at that point done any television, mm. but he wanted his friend there who he enjoyed working with on the radio yes. series. He wanted him at the helm. And the BBC, you know, Alan was well sort of steeped in the BBC culture of how it was then and yeah. they weren't going to swap him just because some writer says, you know, yes. uh, unfortunately. So Douglas just didn't write it. 
Yeah, so that was the way things were done at the BBC sometimes in those days. That was it. Even we were Douglas. disappointed. Yes. My boss was disappointed. He just spent about 60 grand on a new computer. Yeah. <laughs> but to be honest, there wasn't much chance of being much script written by Douglas yet if it hadn't even been commissioned. There was, there was time for a long more <laughs> oh, yeah. after that. So. He was very good for the first few scripts. You know, when you look at the commissioning dates and the date that he delivered, he was very good at first on the first few radio sh series of Hitchhiker, but... Um, it kind of got a bit ragged as it went along. OK. Um, any more questions from further back? Well, it's always an indicator of how... Oh, yeah. Oh, right. There you are. So there's two hands. So it's, it's one person wanting to ask a question and a, and a helpmate. Um, and we're getting a microphone along to you. OK, here we go. Hello. Um, I'm Barry, and I'm the president of the official fan club. I just wondered if you'd found much in the archives um, about what Douglas Adams thought about his fans and whether he felt pressured to write more hitchhiker stuff rather than some perhaps more innovative things that you might be thinking about. Well, did, so that's, there's several questions there. But So what did he think of his fans? I notice you've got the... Something's labelled as his first fan letter. He's, in, I was delighted to discover that. Yeah. There's a piece in there as well um, about him wondering about what the fans are thinking when they come to see him sign. I once did... I, I was shooting a documentary uh, about him doing a signing, and it was next door to where he lived. I don't think most of the people who were getting their books signed realised that he actually lived up on top of the flat, you know, with the one with the roof oh, garden. Oh, in Upper Street. Next yeah, door. Yeah. yeah. And, um, yeah. But, no, he, he loved doing all that because, because it just got him away from the typewriter. He liked all <laughs> yeah. the, the interaction with, with fans and answering questions. And he says in the book, they're mostly nice, engaging people, but there isn't time to talk to them properly. Mm. And, uh, and he says, and people come up with the idea of, oh, uh, you know, sort of seeing him sitting there signing for ages, you know, does your hand hurt yet? <laughs> and they've thought it up before yes, they arrived, sure. and, of course, they end up being first in the queue, so <laughs> what they said doesn't make sense. So, <laughs> <laughs> so as, as fans, are, as a general thing, and since you're the president, you can speak on behalf of all fans, uh, are, are, are you... Um, are you difficult fans? Are you fans that say, oh, no, wait a minute, uh, chapter seven of book three uh, contradicts where the location of, uh, uh, I don't know, Beetle Brock, you know, some, something is uh, inaccurately given? Uh, well, I can tell you're adorable just from that. <laughs> Yeah. So, Sophie, uh, yeah. you... Uh, I don't know if it was within your remit to deal with fans, or do you yeah. just concern yourself with Ed, Victor and no, Hollywood? No, no, and very much fans. I mean, you know, you saw his business card there. He never, he never... That was on the website. You know, he never sort of hid, you know, ways of contacting him personally. And although I was there to sort of field a lot of the fan inquiries, um, you know, I think he loved all of that. I don't think he ever got tired of, of, of wanting... Of, of being being sort of wanted like that, yes. you know, and signing autographs and postcards, you know, photos and having them sent off in the post. And he would like addressing yeah, large absolutely. gatherings of... Uh, yeah, very I, much I so. Think, I think w w when you get to be that famous, and I, like, we all do, travel quite a lot with him, mm. and I think that, you, you know, you could be on a... You'd go on a meet, be on a Microsoft campus, and uh, you'd be being taken around, and you'd go into a room full of programmers who literally couldn't speak with excitement because Douglas was in the room. <laughs> and it both thrilled Douglas and embarrassed him. Mm. I think he sometimes didn't know in that immediate interaction quite what to do with that. Mm. I think that it was... And, and, and with fans, I saw it. Mm. So you get, you get the fans who do the, you know, I put it to you, that, this, you know, this contradiction here. Yeah. But you also, you would get, you'd get the people who would come up and want to do the... Before Douglas had even said anything, do the, well, you're not so special, you know, kind of be a bit aggressive mm. and in his face r right at the beginning. Yeah. So I think, it, I think it's, a, it's a complex relationship that you have at that level of fame. And I think one of the other things, Douglas was immensely gregarious, but there was a shy side mm. to him as well, mm. that, that it, wasn't, it wasn't always, always easy. Um, and... And a bit of stage fight thrown yes, into that and as a bit well. Of, yeah, you know, that's we right. We were talking about this before, but, you know, big events that he would speak at, you know, there was definitely a... 
a, a sort of warm up to that that involved a lot of getting rid of the nerves and everything. So yeah, yeah, so I, think, I think it's. Uh, I mean, he adored the. You know, the, he did. He loved the fans, and he, you know, he was he was very mindful of that. And I think you know, at, at another level, you're right. I mean, Hitchhikers. I talked about the sort of the, the, the gravitational pull of it was hard for him because yeah, it made money. Um, and he loved it. But I think it was hard work by the time you were getting his books four to five, to be honest. And I think Mostly Harmless, which was written at a time which was difficult in his life for a number of reasons, it, 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 it was hard work. And what's interesting, you think about the novel writing, Douglas, because he was gregarious and quite like teams, there was a loneliness of that mm -hmm. as well, the loneliness of being a writer. And Douglas liked company. Um, so yeah, that, like anything, it's complex and it's a bit. It's a bit. It, we we had a, a lot of fans working with us, didn't we? We I did. Mean, you know, yeah. That was. Yeah, a lot their of people. Dream job, as really. apart from people who joined the complex, <laughs> they thought they were coming about rabbits. Yes. <laughs> 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 but when he moved on to Dirk Gently, uh, as presumably a different selection of fans there. I don't, would, do you, does your presidency cover Dirk Gently fans as well as? All right. Is there a rival group, the Dirk Gentleys? So <laughs> <laughs> it's hard for them to sound too aggressive. Dirk I think there was a younger crowd who really liked the TV series of Dirk Gently uh, from a few years ago oh, that Arvin right. did in America. Yeah. Mm. And that, that had a younger crowd, and it's yeah. great when it attracts... I think that's what it was great about the movie. Uh, not all the old diehard fans went with the movie on every level. Nope. It's that's beautiful true. to look at. Um, it did play with his words a bit. But... I think it introduced Definitely. the title to a new audience who, with a bit of luck, went off and found... And we know we've got examples of this. They went off and found either the books or the radio or the talking books. And they came know. at it without the potentially the sort of purest sort of angle that maybe yeah. Yeah. the original fans did. And my son um, was the right age. He loved it. That yeah, was his first encounter with Hitchhiker, and it worked perfectly for him. Yeah. The one thing I can say about the movie, I and mean, it was a labour of love. I mean, nobody did it. It was taken immensely seriously. I don't think it was a... It was a difficult thing to do. Uh, I think some of it worked. I was always glad, glad that in a Hollywood movie we were able to keep a whale, you know, falling to earth, ruminating on the nature of language yeah. and ontology and existence and the nature of <laughs> the relationship between language and existence. Um, but it, it was it, it was a labour of love from from the studio onwards. And I I remember being at the the press conference and um, the first a big press conference sort of you know. Uh, and the first question was about, about a review that a, an uber fan had written, who'd got a preview, and he hated the movie. Absolutely, like this 10,000 word diatribe about it. <coughs> and I'm sitting there, and um, uh, it was the first question from the first journalist, and of course it comes to me to, to handle. Mm -hmm. and Bill, Nye, Bill Nye was there, because he, he played Slarty Blockfast, and... Uh, he said, yes, I, 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 I read the first 500, but I couldn't do the next 10,000. <laughs> Thankfully, everybody laughed, and that was all right. Yeah. But I was incredibly mindful of that. I was yeah. incredibly mindful of that. And I, I have a dream. I have a dream. It's a strange dream. I had two of these dreams. Like my, both my father and Douglas, maybe it's something, but where they, they, they didn't actually die. They, they'd kind of gone away and came back. Right. There's always that slight thing in my relationship with Douglas is, did I... Did I do a good or a bad thing in helping to get the movie made? And I still have that recurring dream. Yeah. So it was it was taken very seriously. Well, the, the, the radio was so you know startling in its 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 form when it when it came up, and yeah. then the the even to call them novels is slightly because they're 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 like they're like novels, but they're not quite novels. But there's a purity to them because you can you can write anything on the page and describe anything you want. You're a full flow of his imagination. Once you start putting pictures, TV or film. You're, there's a problem to each each point, and you're having to solve that problem. So inevitably, that's uh, it's not such a pure exercise. It's more of uh, dealing with those issues. And I think is there's a discursiveness the about the Hitchhikers. Yes. It's the joy of going off into the, the guide entry. It, uh, and for a movie, you've just got that narrative drive. Mm. And so what we found with the movie is, you know, guide entries, funnily enough, stopped it dead. Mm. It yeah. stopped it dead. And so we had far more created. And I also think it got cut too short. I think actually Hollywood wanted to do, to be running at a time, and I think length is not necessarily right back to length, not necessarily <laughs> yeah. a thing to do with running time. It it actually I think would have been better some of it allowed to breathe just a bit more, and I think that would have been more effective. I think there was some good stuff that didn't hit the 
Did they hit the topic All right. Uh, we, we are going to be running out of time here soon, so if you've got a question, don't be, uh, don't hold back. Now is the time. Yeah, yes, sir. Uh, again. Oh, well, your voice sounded pretty loud anyway. But uh, <laughs> for the benefit of the cameras and people at home, we need <laughs> yes, the microphone. Of course. Yeah, it's. Am I on? No, but uh, <laughs> I'll project. And oh, there you go. That's it. Right, anyway, so Kevin, it's Neil here. Uh, obviously, the book has been a fantastic success, well deserved. But what next? Another book, and if so on Douglas or something else? We, we've, we've had a little discussion. There, there's something hanging around in the background that I've always wanted to do. There's one unpublished thing of Douglas's which nobody's ever seen, oh. and that is the television scripts. They have unique Douglasisms in them, and uh, we don't know if it's possible. We don't know what the right situation is, so uh, who knows? Who knows? But, I mean, yeah, I've got a couple of other things to do, so... I've got a Doctor Who thing to do. I made a big Doctor Who documentary for the 30th anniversary of Doctor Who, and we're just coming up on the 60th anniversary of Doctor Who. And someone's asked, another publisher's asked me to do a book about that. So I've got that. Wow, one. there's yeah. yet more that there's you more. could. <laughs> yeah. it, uh, what did occur to me that I should have asked earlier, and I, I, we got lost away, but collaborating uh, with Douglas and writing with him, we've got Martin and Will sitting in the front <laughs> row there. So, uh, so I just wonder if either or both of you would like to. Because I remember you producing scripts together, but they came as a thing. It came from the three of you. But uh, was he striding around the room uh, saying, I must do this? Or were you really <laughs> writing all of it and he was a mere cipher? What's, the, uh, what's your, your memory of that, uh, Martin? I, well, I think Will and I wrote together. Douglas wrote separately. Douglas would come up to our college in Prince William with a paragraph which he would laugh all the way through the delivery of. Yes. <laughs> Thus indicating where the jokes were before, yeah. we, before we even heard yes. the lines. <laughs> he, he, yeah. he was. He, he, yeah, he was tremendous. But, you know, he, and then he'd leave it with us to then turn into something that was slightly longer than a paragraph. Yeah. And so he'd go back to St John's and probably have a few drinks. And we'd be left with trying to turn a paragraph into three minutes, mm. which is sort of a you know, yabbery sketch. So we'd do that, and then we'd go back down to St John's with a finished sketch. And you'd go, eh, a few more interesting ideas. <laughs> and it shows a sentence. It was slightly, it was a bit like the paragraph, but shorter. Yes. <laughs> there was negative writing again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I actually think that he, he, his ideal was to come up with the funniest word. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Or number. A, a short, pithy uh, word. The, yeah. the shortest, the shortest yeah. word ever that would make people laugh. But anyway, they said we, we, we would do this as a, it was. It was almost like a game, of, a, a, a game. Yes. Basically, to and fro between us, and, and we'd end up with something that was sort of. Uh, it, 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 we provided the dialogue. He provided the um, the role scenes. Yeah, it was almost though your your the weirdness. the bus pirate sketch, for example, was yeah. a classic one where, where he, he decided that bus uh, the, the bus pirates existed, yes. and we had to turn it into something that people would believe in. Yes, we had to turn it into a into a story. Really, it had to have. You know, the beginning, mm. middle, and the end. And then, don't, don't, just, just have the ideas. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, you just do that on stage. <laughs> so it's almost like you, in some regards, you were like editors, or instead of being editors that reduce things down, you were expanding things <laughs> into the well, full we, site. We, yes, well, we, yes, exactly. He was doing the reduction, and we yeah. were attempting to try yeah. and turn it into something that was slightly longer than a cop. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. All right. I'm very grateful for you guys letting us put a load of that material in the book, though, because it's it's <laughs> nice to yeah. nice to see it preserved there for everyone. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So the fact that it's a lot of it in my handwriting doesn't mean <laughs> that I wrote it all. No, no. I just simply wrote it down. Yeah. Do Wait a minute. Know? As as your lawyer, I would advise the fact it's in your handwriting <laughs> means you own all of it, and he has to pay you for every every word. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. So far, yeah. Well, the way royalties are paid now, you can look at the Sky yes. or Disney Plus or <laughs> Apple or, uh, or Netflix. You get nothing, sir, so does it? Yeah. Yeah. 
It was a complete buyout <laughs> when, you, when you agreed to it. Look, I think we're coming to the end. Unless there are any questions that have flown in, the, the internet has not, um, or have, maybe it has. Oh, there is a question. Well, there is, there is one that is like an interesting way to maybe to round up, which is, um, this is a Diana says, I'm sad because I feel there's only one generation who will understand the significance of answering 42. Does Douglas Adams age well? Is he attracting a new generation of fans? Well, you, you've attracted a, a generation of fans for your book or the book you've edited. I hope so. Are they, are they all, uh, let's call us old farts, like me, <laughs> uh, or and old me. fans, or not old farts, but uh, who have bought all the previous uh, aspects of Douglas, or are they younger people who've maybe uh, heard the radio, read the books, or, or whatever? Well, it's nice when on a couple of the Facebook pages, like um, Barry out there, um, you know, the ZZ9 page, um, Galactic Hitchhikers, which is run from America, has thousands of people. Um, and every now and again, a new young person comes on, and it's quite exciting to see them getting all infused about mm. it because they're reading it for the first time. Yes. And that, that I'm very keen when I see that and sort of always try and interact a bit and sort of say, yeah. encourage them. Right. Um, well, now, Martin, you're going to tell yeah, me. You know, a, a, a year before COVID, Will and I were asked to go up to Cambridge by David Haddock uh, to, to wander around Cambridge you know, talking about Douglas. And one of the most uh, interesting and, uh, and, and incredibly enthusiastic people who came along with us. There was a large group of people from around the world who wandered around Cambridge. And this this 11-year-old from Washington yes. who kept going, Hey, you're bloody Martin Smith from Triton! <laughs> 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 yes, especially for this town. He, yes. and, and he didn't even know where Crichton was. No. <laughs> and he was sad for yeah. the truth. Yeah. <laughs> You don't need to know that, though, do you? You don't even want to know where. <laughs> but you are Martin Smith. Yes. Yeah. Oh. Do you know what? That was the problem with the film. They did not. Hollywood was not interested in Croydon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think. I think Steve, Steve, Stephen Fry said a very smart thing about Hitchhiker and Hitchhiker fans. He said everybody. I think Douglas had one of those things as an author that speaks very directly to people. People feel that they were speaking to him, his intelligence, that wit, that humour, all of that brilliance, that genius. But Stephen said, everybody feels that I get it just that little bit more than everybody else does. <laughs> but just that little bit more uh, directly right. to me. Yes, I understood great. him. And I think there's something, there's a, a story, a lovely story to the, to, to the question, Douglas. It's a little while ago, but uh, a, a, a man had been having a difficult time, was going through a divorce. Uh, the new partner he was with bought him and his 12-year-old son, who he was, had, was struggling, both a copy of Hitchhikers. And they read it at the same time, and they kind of reconnected. Oh. So I think there's still that kind of, that there is a freshness for a smart people who like those underlying ideas, the fizz of ideas, mm. that Catherine wheel of ideas mm. that was Douglas. There's a kind of mind that loves that. And there are 12-year-olds who are loving it and discovering it now. Margo, hi. Uh, Margo's other half wit, so they're great friends of Douglas's. He's not here. He's not yeah, here. I know he's not here. That. But I yeah. interviewed Wix for one of the projects, um, and he said that he finds that a lot of people feel, even if they'd never met him, they feel like they know Douglas All right. through his work. And he was the first one I ever remember articulating that. All right. Yeah. Well, I think we all feel we know him, even those of us who did know him and those who didn't know him feel we know him more, from, uh, especially if we've had a chance to go through this magnificent <laughs> book. But thank, uh, I'd like to thank everybody here for taking part in this. Uh, you know, Kevin, Sue, uh, Sophie and Robbie uh, for taking So maybe a, a round of applause for <laughs> their contribution. <laughs> It occurs to me, it occurs to me I have the right to prop here to say, uh, and Douglas Adams, this is your lift. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>